Thank you for the introduction. So I, I'm a director with uh, Field Fisher in uh, Field Fisher's Privacy, Security and Information Law team. Um, uh, Field Fisher are an international law firm and um, we have a very, very large dedicated privacy team. So there's something like 45 of us dedicated to doing privacy work around the world, which is um, pretty big for a, a law firm and, and unusual. Um, and in fact, it's one of the reasons I wanted to join Field Fisher, because I wanted loads of geeks to bounce ideas and thoughts off of. Right, so I, I, I'm going to talk to you about liability under the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, so I'm the harbinger of doom, basically. <laughs> it's, <laughs> this is what's the worst that can happen. Okay, so as you will have heard, it introduces some significant um, compliance obligations for businesses that certainly in the UK we're not used to dealing with, given we've had quite a, a relaxed attitude to data protection um, to date. It also introduces requirements directly on data processors. So at the moment, our data protection laws in the UK apply only to controllers. The regulation will apply in some cases directly to data processors. So if you're a service provider too, a controller. Um, previously, you could completely ignore the Data Protection Act in that respect, um, but going forward, you won't be able to. It also provides some major new investigation and enforcement powers. Um, mandatory audit rights, so private sector organisations, the regulators can come in and audit you, and these significant fines, which I'm sure you will have heard about, and I'm going to go into a bit more detail on that. It also um, introduces some new rights around direct subject uh, uh, claims. So data subjects, the individuals who the data is about, they can come after you at the moment if they wanted to. A lot of them don't because it's a bit of a pain in the backside and they won't get much money. So they could take you to court if they want to, it doesn't happen a lot, so you don't hear about it a lot. It's going to get a lot easier to do this going forward So uh, for them. So I'm going to uh, go into this um, in a bit of detail. What you also have to bear in mind is not only are we going to have these new enforcement um, rules introduced, you, it's much more likely that you will get found out in the future. And the way that you will likely get found out is if you have a security incident which you have to notify to the regulator. At the moment, you don't have to notify incidents to the regulator. It's a voluntary thing. They like you to tell them, and there's guidance on telling them about serious breaches. It's not the law in the UK. Going forwards, it will be the law for certain breaches to tell the regulator, and you'll have to do it within 72 hours, so it doesn't give you a lot of time. Fines. There's two bands of fines. There's the low band, of a mere 2% of your global annual turnover or 10 million euro. And it's the higher of those. So if you're in the, a, a, a private sector organization, um, if you're very, very large, don't think it'll just be the 10 million euros. It'll be the 2% of your global annual turnover. And then you've got the higher band, which is up to 4% of global annual turnover or 20 million euros. Global annual turnover. What is this? It is not necessarily just the turnover of the company that's breached. If you're part of a big group of companies and you have between you as a group a very sizable global annual turnover, those fines could well be levied against the turnover of the group, not just the individual company that may have suffered the breach. They're not very clear on this in the regulation itself, but this is what could happen. And if they t take a leaf out of the, say, competition law book, that's how it works in terms of fines. And now with new health and safety laws that have been introduced, that's how it will work with fines as well. So we're anticipating that for data protection fines, it's going to be the same. If that wasn't enough, <laughs> So you've got these bandings for certain breaches for which you could get these big fines. Um, member states can also put in place penalties for GDPR infringements if it's not already covered by the GDPR. 
here's the good news. I'm afraid it's the only good news you'll get today from me or in this session. If you've got multiple um, breaches relating to the same processing, they will go after you for the highest fine, for the worst of the breaches related to the same processing. That's the fine that you will get. So if you'd say breached three elements of the GDPR, you won't get three times up to 2% or 4% of your global annual turnover. But that's only if it relates to the same processing. So what can you get fined for? Um, I'm not going to actually um, speak in too much detail and sort of run through every single um, one of these items for which you can get fined, because I want to get to my last slide, which is the more interesting one, <laughs> where, where I'm going to try and apply this to, to a scenario in practice. But do take particular note of 2% or 10 million euros for data security breaches. So Article 32, that is where you have some specific requirements around putting in place your technical and organisational security um, obligations, uh, requirements. That applies both to the data controller and it applies directly to a data processor as well. So everybody is responsible for making sure that data is secure. And Article 33, notification of breaches to regulators. You can get fined up to 2% or 10 million euros. I'm just going to say 2% because I'm taking it that most of you would be in, in line for 2% of your global annual turnover. So some, you can also get fined 2% for these things. I'm going to skip on to 4% <laughs> or 20 million euro fines. I like that line from the ICO, so 20 million reasons for organisations to get EU data, data reforms right. So you can get fined up to 4% of your global annual turnover for breaches relating to the very, very fundamental parts of data protection law, which is around the principles, fair processing, transparency, purpose limitation, i.e. only do with it what you said you were going to do collect minimal data, make sure it's accurate. Take note of the integrity and confidentiality one. So there's a separate security obligation which if you breach you can get fined up to 2% of your global annual turnover. But bear in mind that within the principles themselves is also the obligation that you make sure that um, there's integrity and confidentiality around this personal data that you're collecting. So in effect it's another security requirement hidden within the, the main principles for which you can get fined up to 4% of your global annual turnover. Sorry, can I just ask, for integrity, does that mean effectively accuracy of the data you, you've obtained in our processing? I think they'd probably give it quite a wide meaning because it's, it's integrity and confidentiality principle. So I think they're quite... They're quite vague, but I think yeah, it would mean that as well. But it might mean, more. But it might mean, but it might mean more. So it might be sort of a hidden um, requirement in there around um, looking after the data. Then also, you've got your transfers of personal data outside of the EU. So bear that one in mind as well. So if you're transferring personal data, and you you gave some good examples on that, where you might be transferring data outside of the EU. Um, that is finable by 4% of your global annual turnover if you've got it wrong. So say you're using an IT service provider, they've got a server where or your backup is in the US. You didn't put in place your model contracts with the service provider or they haven't got privacy shield in place. That's 4% finable. So who can be fined? Because the law applies to both controllers and processors, each can be fined for non-compliance with their obligations under the regulations. So if it's an obligation that applies to me as a data controller, I get fined for breaching it. If it's an obligation that applies to me as a data processor, and bearing in mind that as a processor you've got security obligations, for example, then I as the processor can be fined directly as well. This is actually one of the reasons why um, 
contracts with your IT providers and other data processors are going to become a lot harder than they have been to date. Not that they haven't been hard already, probably, but they're going to get a lot harder because your third-party providers will now suddenly not be able to just ring-fence their liability under the contract by saying, do you know what? We'll only be liable to 100% of our, our fees for the last year. Regulators, if they say a security incident, which they're responsible for, will be able to come after them directly and they'll get fined directly. So this is big risk for processors that they didn't have before. If you're the processor, you also want to make sure that you're not doing anything with the data which strays outside of what you've agreed in the contract you're going to do because then you could also become responsible for that and subject to fines. In effect, actually, what's happening there is you're no longer processing the data just for the controller. As a processor, you become a, a controller yourself. So each of those, so it's not like you have to go after one or the other if you're the regulator. Each of them could be fined for their breaches of the legislation, up to whatever the, the caps are. Watch out for your own breaches caused by other data controllers or processors. So what I mean by that is we live in a world of you know, connected cars. We live in a world of um, lots of complicated data sharing arrangements, um, access to systems being granted, all sorts. Watch out for another entity causing you to be in breach of your obligations. So what's the sort of factors that the regulators will take into account? And just sort of touching on the conversation you were having earlier, <laughs> these are the sort of factors the ICO might take into account when considering whether to impose a fine on you. So they'll look at the nature, gravity, duration, type of data and numbers involved. Duration, you know, actually, they might look way back, mightn't they, to whether this was something that's been ongoing since before the regulation came in. They'll look at what mitigation measures you put in place. So if something happened, what did you do about it and, and how quickly did you do it? They'll look at was it intentional or was it negligent? By which they mean it was negligent if it wasn't intentional. So basically, you've done something not intentionally, well, you weren't conscious of the fact that you were breaching the law. Intentional, did you know about it? Possibly. For example, you might find in a data protection impact assessment that you've done, you know what the obligations are and you might have concluded that in some areas you're not going to comply. The regulator might ask to see that data protection impact assessment and conclude, hmm, you deliberately decided that you weren't going to comply with the law. It's an intentional breach. We're going to take that into account. Degree of responsibility. So how responsible were you for this particular thing that happened, this non-compliance. In these very complicated data sharing arrangements that you might have, um, you might have lots of different data controllers involved. If you're a joint data controller, then you have a responsibility to divvy up between you who has what obligations. Now, don't think that that gets you out of your responsibilities as, as a data controller fundamentally. You can't sort of pass them off to another data controller. But if you've got those arrangements in place and you've divvied things up in your contract between you and the other controller, the regulator might look at, well, actually, which of these controllers actually had said they were going to do this? What did they agree? Adherence to codes of conduct and certifications they might look at. So we don't have any of these at the moment, but when they put in place codes of conduct, conduct and certifications around GDPR compliance, they might look at whether actually you followed the code of conduct or you followed the certification and something still went wrong. So that might be in your favour if you, you'd followed that and you can show that. Track record they might look at of incidents and um, so what you know, basically, are you known to the regulator um, as a serial breacher? Um, and previous orders, so have they ordered you to do something in the past and you didn't do it? How cooperative you are with the regulator, they may well look at, and how you came to their attention. Um, so, I mean, 
you always want to appear to be cooperative with regulators, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Well, <laughs> and be cooperative, but bearing in mind the interests of the company at the same time. Um, how you came to their attention? So, if you were due to tell the regulator, but you didn't, but someone dobs you in. So it might be another data controller that's involved in an incident. They've raced off to the regulator and told the regulator about it, and you didn't get there first to tell them about it. That might count against you. And then we'll look at aggravating and mitigating factors. That's their catch-all, as in we'll look at anything we like. So, anyone who suffers damage has a right to compensation from the controller or the processor. So this is individuals can come after you. This is bringing a claim before the courts for compensation. And this is the interesting part of the regulation that we've not had before. They can claim full compensation from any controller or processor involved in the processing. That doesn't mean full compensation for the elements that you were at fault for. That means full compensation. That means in world of connected vehicles, data sharing, complex arrangements, lots of controllers and processors all connected together, all of the liability including damages which they caused and they contributed to, you as the, the controller there in the frame, they've come after you, you will be liable potentially for the entire damage caused, including by everybody else. The regulation then says you have a right to claim back those damages from those other controllers or processors. It's a very short sentence about it, not taking into account how complicated that actually might be. <laughs> the only exemption that you will have is if you can prove that you are absolutely in no way responsible for the damages caused. So if you had no hand in this whatsoever, then you could sidestep these claims. If you have a hand in this, even if it was 1% your fault, then they can come after you for these claims. Now, previously, um, this wouldn't have been so much of a concern because data subject claims are quite rare, as I said earlier, because it's quite difficult for an individual to go to court and come after you and bring one of these claims. It's time consuming, it's distressing for them, they might need to get a lawyer and they probably won't get a great deal of money in the scheme of things. We're talking in the a few thousand often, you know, not, not massive amounts. We're not talking millions. But under the GDPR, what they've written into the legislation is a new article, this little, little article 80 here, which basically says that not-for-profit organisations can represent individuals. This is a big danger for organisations that have big databases. If you have a lot of employees, if you have a lot of customers on your database, you've got a big database, a not-for-profit organisation could come along and say, everybody, sign up with me, give me the mandate, and I will represent all of you all in one go. So you suddenly we'll find that these individuals can very easily sign up to this. They don't have all this hassle. They, they might only end up getting a little bit of compensation, but when you add it all up, it could be a lot of compensation in total. And it might be very easy for them to get that now. So there's some difficulties around the data subject claims issues in practice. So let's say you've been saddled with all of this, um, this, this compensation claim and you've paid out even though it wasn't really all your fault and there were quite a lot of, a lot of other controllers and processors involved that had a, a hand in this. You've now decided that you want to claim back your monies from all of these others. What sort of difficulty might you have? Well, how do you claim it back? It doesn't say in the GDPR, so you're probably still just going to have to go to court. So this is a legal claim that you're going to have to bring. 
what's the problem with legal claims? <laughs> you have to prove stuff. You have to prove that actually there was a breach by the other party. So A, that it applies, that there was a breach, and C, you have to show that that breach actually caused some sort of loss. So you're going to have to go and prove this against all of these other parties to try and get your money back, if you can, through the courts. Bearing in mind, it might also be further complicated by contracts that you have in place in which you might have agreed with the other party that you're going to cap or limit your liability or exclude certain liabilities entirely. So there's a difficulty. <laughs> Another difficulty as well is that processors have very limited responsibilities. So if you're going to try and say if it's your IT service provider that caused this, this issue and you want to claim back against them, you're stuck with your, your contract for claiming against them if actually it's not a responsibility of theirs under the General Data Protection Regulation because processors don't, are not responsible for everything that you are as a data controller under the regulation. So it needs to be one of those particular responsibilities for you to be able to claim, claim, claim back under the law. Controllers have very wide responsibilities and likely have the same responsibilities in relation to the same data. So that's going to that's going to um, be another complicating factor because actually, how do you go about, or how do the courts go about apportioning liability for these claims? That's going to be really difficult. So how likely are these claims in practice? Now that I've covered this, so basically, I think they could be more likely um, because of these class action style claims that could be brought where, the, where you mandate a not-for-profit organisation. Might take a while for pe people to cotton on to this though, although I, I wouldn't, I mean, uh, there might be that um, say works councils or organisations like which act might be gearing up for this sort of claim, who knows. So other powers that the regulators have, so they can order you to provide information to them, they can come and do mandatory data protection audits on you, which um, currently they can't do, except for public sector bodies. They can order you to give them access to the personal data and other information itself. Um, they can actually come and access your premises and access all of your equipment. And they can review your certifications if you went for a certification. So it's actually really pretty wide. So. Um, even more chances of being found out because what if something there's something goes wrong say a security incident again you've notified it to the regulator the regulator says I feel I need to investigate this further and suddenly because they're like rooting around in all your systems and your processes and looking at everything that you do with data and all your policies and training etc they realize that you're in breach of all sorts of other things as well it's not just about this security incident there's a whole culture of non-compliance within your organization They also have corrective powers, so I've touched on the um, fines already, but they can just issue you a, with a warning or a reprimand. They can order you to comply with the General Data Protection Regulation um, or comply with data subject rights or tell data subjects about a breach. This is, this is an interesting one. They can order a ban on your processing of personal data and they can suspend your transfers of personal data outside of Europe. My word, that could put a stop to your whole business, let alone being fined. They can order rectification, erasure or restriction of data. Well, actually, that's probably stuff that you, that's, that's you doing stuff that you should have been doing anyway. The difficulty being that if they order you to do it and you're not technically geared up to do it, that could cause some problems. You might need to change your systems, your IT systems. That's not cheap or easy or quick to do. And if you went for a certification, um, you're very proud to have got this, they might actually order that it's withdrawn. So, what's the worst that can happen? I think you're, so, you're probably starting to get the picture as to what's the worst that could happen. So I talked about these sort of complicated arrangements that we might well have in place nowadays. So you could have driver and passenger data, 
all sorts of information. Contact details, people's driving history, license to drive. Um, location data, so connected vehicles nowadays will track location of vehicles more often than not. That's personal data because you know exactly where the driver is. Driving behaviour, by, by which I mean telematics information. So you could well be uh, tracking through the vehicle exactly how that vehicle is being driven. Your purpose might be because you're interested in vehicle diagnostics, but technically you may also be collecting personal data about the individual driver as well because you're tracking exactly how the driver is driving. Are they really heavy on the brakes? Are they speeding a lot, <laughs> um, going over speed limits? You could be tracking all sorts of things actually about the driver's behaviour. So who could have access to all of this sorts of information? Um, it could be any of these organisations that I've put up on, on here and many, many more. So these are just a few. So let's take a scenario. Let's say you've got an IT service provider. They're based in Europe, but they use subprocessors in Timbuktu. So they've got, they outsource to Timbuktu. And let's say we've got a leasing company and they've got a very, very, very large database of customers and they service lots of fleets. One of these is employer with a, with a fleet of vehicles of around about 10,000 10, drivers. Now they're very um, cooperative and they do all sorts of um, interesting things, this leasing company, um, and occasionally say where you need to, um, the, the fleet needs to plug in a rental vehicle um, they allow the rental vehicles company access to this database as well. And they, and they can update stuff in there. They also allow the employer access to this database because the en employer has a vested interest in knowing a lot of this information that's being collected on this database by the leasing company. Occasionally, when a vehicle needs to be recovered, they'll let the AA or whoever have direct access as well. So they know exactly where the vehicle is and uh, they have some access to the diagnostics on the vehicle. The insurer might have been given access because uh, uh, they wanted to know whether someone was speeding at the time of an incident. Um, and you might have the maintenance and repair company having access as well. So they're all very cooperative. And they've all got access to it. It doesn't usually happen as simply as this, but for the purpose of my example, it, it's going to. <laughs> it's usually more complicated. But let's say they've all got access to this database. They're all able to go in. They're able to update information in this database and extract information from it and use it for, for their own purposes. They're all data controllers for this data, except for the IT service provider, who's a data processor who is processing the personal data on behalf of the controllers. But actually, because it was the leasing company that commissioned this piece of uh, this database and software and all, everything that it does that's really whizzy, they put in place the contract with this telematics provider. They didn't put any place, in place any contracts with all these other data controllers because well, you know, it's their database and they can grant them access rights. So they just gave them a user license that allows them to come in and, and do stuff. So, guess what happens? There's a big incident, security incident. Someone comes in, takes the information off of the system, and it's out there on the dark web. And this information that they've taken relates to the 10,000 drivers of the, the fleet of this particular employer. So, who's in the frame? <laughs> Potentially, all of them. Every single one of them. They're all data controllers with responsibility to keep personal data secure. They're all data controllers for data in this database. All of them could potentially be fined by regulators. <laughs> 
The data processor, because security is one of the obligations that applies directly to data processors, if it was the data processor that was in f at fault in terms of security, they could be fined directly as well. Now let's say these employees have a very strong works council and the works council gets involved and says, why don't you mandate me, us as your works council to bring a claim against the employer on your behalf because of this loss of data? And they do just that. So they bring a claim, a claim against employer. The courts decide, actually, these individuals, we can't prove that they've suffered any big loss as a result of this incident, but they've suffered damage and distress as a result of your actions. And we're going to award these 10,000 employees £1,000 each. So employer suddenly, as well as getting fined, gets a, a claim of potentially 10 million. Now that employer has to go and try and recover all of these damages from everybody else. Can't do it contractually, there's no contracts in place. So you've somehow got to go through this whole process of figuring out who actually was up to blame for this incident and recover your damages. And that's not necessarily gonna be easy. Now what could they be fined? Well, security incident, 2% of your global annual turnover. So each of these um, entities may well get fined 2% of their global annual turnover. Let's say it's the leasing company that's uh, primarily investigated by the regulator because um, they're the obvious entity. And it turns out that it was the, the telematics provider actually hadn't done what they were supposed to do in terms of security. Does that mean the controller's off the hook? No, because actually the controller has a responsibility to make sure that its data processors put in place the right security. So you agree what the right security is and you have to make sure that they're doing it. And you do due diligence before you even contract with them. So as a controller, you could still be on the hook. But the telematics provider is potentially on the hook because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. So they get fined up to 2% of their global annual turnover. Now, in all the kerfuffle, they forgot that you have to tell the regulator about the breach within 72 hours. As it turns out, it was the Works Council that went and told the, um, told the regulator about the breach. Right, says the regulator. That's not a breach necessarily relating to this proce uh, processing. That's a separate breach of the General Data Protection Regulation. I'm going to fine you for that as well in addition. Oh, and by the way, as I was investigating and looking at what you were doing from a data protection perspective, I spotted another separate breach. You didn't put in place a data transfer agreement with your telematics provider, but you go, well, well actually, says the leasing company, they're, they're in Europe, so I didn't think I needed to. No, says the regulator, because they're outsourcing to Timbuktu you then actually have to put your model contracts in place. These are data transfer agreements, which have been written by the European Commission for us, with the entity in Timbuktu, and you didn't do that. That's finable up to 4% of your global annual turnover. So you can see how these things could add up. So, you know, we're talking about max, you know, we're talking about headlines of 4% of global annual turnover. In reality, you, you could be looking at multiples of these fines once a regulator starts looking at what you're actually doing. So I'm going to hand over to you now. <laughs> and any questions, or are you stunned into silence? <laughs> I'm certainly stunned into silence. I think we were just wondering. It, it's it's quite a punitive environment. So. That sounds like it's deliberate, Kirsten. I guess it's just to focus businesses' mind and the, the Googles and the others that perhaps are processing data. Were there any questions for Kirsten on that subject? I think you've certainly... Just that scenario, I'm just perhaps paint another, Sarah, perhaps get your opinion. Rental company rents out vehicles. It's a connected car. The customer thinks it's a wonderful app. You know, I'm going to download all my music, my contact details, and has a relationship with the manufacturer. There's a breach by the manufacturer. 
Will the rental company be responsible, do you think, in any particular way, if the, if the OEM, because there's a direct relationship between the customer and the um, um, driver, will the rental company as the provider of that service be responsible, do you think? And that is where you would look at, are they a data controller for that data? So if there's something happens to that data or something's not happening with that data that should be happening, are they a data controller for that data? Um, so do they, de and a controller de determines the purpose for which mm. and means by which data is processed. So if they are, then potentially, yes, they could mm. they could be liable as well. If they have access to that data. If they have access to it, yeah. then, then quite potentially, potentially, yes. Yeah, interesting. Kevin. Brilliant presentation, Kirsten. I'm never stunned into silence, by that. <laughs> Two questions. The first is probably quite simple. The second, maybe not quite so. So um, regarding the general regulations, and uh, a timeline of when they apply uh, and whether they can apply to events in the past. So let's say a data controller is in breach today, general data protection regulations don't come into force till May next year, but the ICO doesn't reach their conclusions, etc., until after May next year. Does it have any retrospective power in, in this context? Hmm. Was that the simple question? It was the simple question. <laughs> I'm dreading your second question. <laughs> um, okay, so um, how does it have... An so appropriate answer we're not sure yet is because there is nobody who's an expert on the general data protection regulation. So. Yeah. So if they, if it actually they're going, it depends on which piece of legislation they're going after, after you under. So actually if they started looking at you under the Data Protection Act, then actually it was the data protection standards and the data protection fines that apply. However, if it's an ongoing breach, there is a cutoff in point where you swap over to GDPR and you're in breach of the new GDPR provisions as well, then actually I can't see any reason as to why they wouldn't actually look at you from a GDPR perspective and those fines um, and if it was a breach under the old act then you're probably breaching the new act as well so they might actually just they might abandon their sort of previous on on the, on the retrospective point that's a really interesting on on midnight 25th of May 2018 yeah. do firms um, have to have got consent under the new GDPR by then, be ready ahead of that midnight sort of change? Or, you know, how does that retrospective point work? Because that's a really important point. You know, when do I need to be compliant from to avoid these fines? Yeah, indeed. Uh, uh, it's a really good question. Um, because at this cutover point, it is not the case that it says in the regulation that everything, you know, everything in the past, let's, let bygones be bygones. That's not what they're saying. In fact, they're not saying anything at all. So actually, what will happen is, if you've been, if you are in breach now, then you continue to be in breach in the future. If you have a new responsibility which you didn't necessarily have currently, um, then you need to make sure that you've complied with that responsibility by the 25th of May, <coughs> because from that date, all, all of these new provisions apply so if you didn't need to get consent before but you do under GDPR then you need to have that consent in place ready for 25th May 2018 and actually probably what is more of an issue I think on the consent point is that a lot of organizations completely over rely on consent because they mistakenly think that getting consent um, covers over a multitude of sins from a data protection perspective and you can do what you want with personal data and you can't. So, so what happens is a lot of organisations say, even to their employees, where technically you probably can't get consent because they haven't got a real choice, um, give us your consent to do X, Y and Z with data or you consent to us doing what we said in our privacy notice with your data. Now actually the problem that you'll have in practice is not going out and getting consent, 
but trying to put in place what you need to put in place instead of consent because they're going to be stricter about consent and if you're relying on consent to process pe people's personal data mistakenly you're suddenly going to find that there's a big issue relying on that when GDPR comes into force if you shouldn't have been relying on it. Does the ICO have the power to randomly audit companies from a data protection point of view? Yes. Yeah, so it doesn't have that an incident doesn't need to be a trigger. They can just come in and say, we want to have a look and see what you're doing. And interestingly on that point, the registration, today we all get registered, we have to go to the ICU annually, that disappears and it's now similar to, to, to the other regulators, they have the right to just say, well, we want to see if you're compliant. So it's a different burden of proof, which should be interesting change. Sorry. I'm going to correct you on that, I'm afraid. Okay. My understanding is... Uh, in the new world, you do not have to disclose to the ICO the nature of your data processing and that will not be on their databases. The data controller has that documentation inside their own organisation to a higher standard, but nonetheless, all data controllers will have to register at the ICO for the purposes of being levied the annual regulatory fee. No, for the fee, There's yeah. There's a bit of a, yeah. a misunderstanding going on yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, my no, second no. question... Not so simple, uh, Kevin, I'm, I'm mindful of time, so I want to give Kirsten a break as well. She's at a, uh, can that question hold, or yeah, we can, do can, we, can we do that later? Just, just a, a sort of f a concluding. What, what happens to all these fines they're going to collect? Does it go to the treasury? What, what they, do they? Will, will regulators be motivated to just, you know, do, you know, create a bit of a fund to do to other activities? What's your I'm, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure whether actually the, the, it will be a different answer on a country by country yeah. basis, as to, you know, depending on how they're set up in that country. Yeah. Okay. Well, if I could thank um, Kirsten, if you could join me, thank her. That's great. <laughs>